In this video, I'll be discussing the minimum welfare standard written in UK law for both captive and wild animals. I will also be discussing some of the issues with these welfare standards and how, as owners, we can be improving on them. If you are a falconer here in the UK, there are laws that you must follow. The two main laws that I will be talking about in this video is the Animal Welfare Act and the Wildlife and Countryside Act. Now, I know some of my viewers are not from the UK, and so your laws may differ to the ones that I will be talking about here, especially those in America, but I still think it's worth hearing because all of these laws are written with the best interests of the animals. The Animal Welfare Act of 2006 brought together and replaced many of the older pieces of legislation regarding animal welfare. The Act covers vertebrates, that's animals with a spine, and cephalopods. If you own one of these animals, then you must abide by the Animal Welfare Act, and it's for good reason. The Act outlaws neglecting to provide any of the basic needs of the animals in your care and unnecessary suffering. According to the Act, you, as the owner of the animal, are always responsible for the welfare of that animal. Even if your animal has been taken care of by somebody else, you're still responsible. And any involvement in animal fighting is strictly prohibited. Before getting any animal, it's important that you know the five freedoms. Written in UK law, there is a welfare standard that all owners of animals must uphold. So what actually are the five freedoms? Freedom from hunger and thirst. You must provide your hawk with a suitable varied diet and fresh clean water every single day. Freedom from discomfort. You must provide your hawk with proper housing and shelter from the weather. Freedom from pain, injury and disease. You must provide your hawk with a safe environment and be registered with a specialist avian vet. Freedom from fear and distress. You must provide her an environment where she can relax. If there are stimuli that you cannot remove, then she must be adequately manned or habituated to that stimulus. There must not be any predators that she cannot escape from in view or prey that she cannot get to. Freedom to express normal behaviours. You must give your hog the opportunity to carry out her natural behaviours. Now this will be covered with the regular flying that you will be doing with her, but you must also allow her to purge and preen all naturally in her aviary. It genuinely baffles me how few falconers actually know about the five freedoms. I am not saying that falconers don't care for their hawks. The falconers that I know care for their hawks to the best of their ability. A lot of them just don't know that it's actually outlined in legislation. And there is nothing stopping you from getting a hawk and giving her the best life possible without having ever have heard of the five freedoms. But when you are new to caring for a hawk, in my opinion, Knowing the five freedoms and applying them to your practices will go a long way in the relationship and the performance of your hawk. Whilst legally you must follow the five freedoms, the way we think about animal welfare has changed since the five freedoms came into effect. My entire working life I have blindly followed the five freedoms without ever questioning any of it, until I stumbled across a thought. My hawks only ever eat when they are hungry. The five freedoms are in place to prevent animals from having negative experiences. But if you start to think about it long enough, you start to see issues. If an animal were to never experience hunger, it would never eat. Feeling hungry is a very natural internal experience. Despite the five freedoms being law, animals still must have these internal negative experiences. And it is our duty as owners to ensure that these are as minimal as possible. And it becomes a bit of a fine line. If your animal never experiences hunger, it is likely overweight. If your animal is experiencing hunger for too long, it will likely become emaciated. But don't panic, I'm not gonna introduce you to the one of the most important animal welfare laws and then tell you how almost impossible it is to follow without offering a new solution. Advancements in the study of the avian brain show fibre architecture may be more like our mammalian brain than we first thought. Birds now must be thought of with a higher level of consciousness of their environment and themselves. Therefore, animal welfare must take into account the bird's ability to perceive experiences as positive or negative. And this is how we can take our practices to the next level with animal welfare.
welfare. The new model for assessing animal welfare is called the five domains and this is built on whether an animal's physical experiences are positive or negative. The combination of positive and negative physical experiences all affect the animal's psychological well-being. Where the five freedoms focuses on creating an acceptable level of welfare by reducing negative experiences, the five domains focuses on actively promoting positive experience for a more optimal level of welfare. The five domains model can be used to assess an animal's welfare based on the fifth domain, its mental state. The mental state is determined by the four physical domains. The four physical domains of which an animal can experience positive or negative experience are nutrition, health, environment and behaviour. We can draw a timeline of the bird's day and take note of behaviours. Behaviours such as bathing, preening and flying are positive experiences, whereas a loud noise that spooked the hawk is a negative experience. In order to improve welfare, the bird needs many positive experiences and the least amount of negative experiences. These positive experiences will benefit the bird's mental well-being. In order to optimise animal welfare, it's not enough to just provide the five freedoms. Positive experiences in each of the physical domains must also be provided. Think of the five freedoms as the bare minimum and positive physical and mental domains as the goal. So what about tethering? How is this good for welfare? Well many would argue that it's not and that they should all be free lofted each in a large aviary. Wild birds spend up to 80% of their day sat on one perch. Birds of prey will typically only fly for food, so when they are not eating, they are perching. If we look at tethering with the five domains in mind, it proves we can still strive for excellent welfare even while tethering our hawks. They are tethered in a safe environment, there are no predators around, and stressful stimuli is few and far between in my garden. This means they have very few chances for a negative experience while being tethered. On the other hand, the birds can comfortably perch, they can sunbathe, they have access to a clean, fresh bath, they can preen themselves, all of these are positive experiences in the bird's mind. Therefore, with little to no negative experiences and many opportunities for positive experiences, I can say with confidence that my birds are in a positive mental state whilst they are tethered. Applying the five freedoms and five domains model to your practices will help to improve your animal's welfare. But as falconers, it's not just the birds in our care that we have laws about. The Wildlife and Countryside Act is in place to protect the wild animals. The Wildlife and Countryside Act is split into four parts containing 17 schedules. As a falconer, you need to be familiar with an overview of the entire act, but pay close attention to part one, wildlife, and schedules one to four. This applies whether you plan to hunt with your hawk or not. Even if you are a display falconer like myself, accidents can happen and given the opportunity, your hawk may try to hunt and kill something. It's just the ethos of the hawk. Part 1 provides protection to birds listed under Schedule 1, their nests and their eggs. It's an offence to kill, injure or take a wild bird, take, injure or interfere with a wild bird's nest and take or destroy the egg of a wild bird. The Act also provides protection to a list of non-bird animals listed under Schedule 5. Now you might be thinking, how does falconry even take place when there's all this protection regarding wild animals? There is a list of animals that you can hunt all year round, but some of these animals fall under a licensing system issued by Natural England. There are three licenses, the general license offering the least amount of protection as this is quite easily acquired, a class license, and a specific license offering the most amount of protection to the listed animals such as badgers. There are three variations to the general license, and this is issued depending on the situation and reason for hunting, conservation purposes, public health and safety, or to prevent serious damage. Each variation of the license does not allow you to hunt every single species listed under the general license. Each species falls under one or more variations of this license. If you're going to hunt mammals with your hog, then there is a list of pest species that can be hunted all year round. If you're going to hunt game, fowl or waterfowl, Schedule 2 covers a list of species. And these species can only be hunted during a specific period of the year called the open season. The open season is through the colder months of the year and this allows the wild populations to replenish themselves throughout the warmer season without the pressures of being hunted. 
Schedule 4 may affect you depending on the species of hawk you choose to hunt with. If you go for one of the American buzzards, such as the Harris hawk or the red-tailed hawk, then Schedule 4 doesn't apply to you. However, if you are crazy enough to go for a goshawk as your first bird, then you must make sure that your bird is rung and registered with the government. These Schedule 4 birds come with documentation called an Article 10, which is also called an A10 in the world of falconry. This is a yellow document with information about the supplier, the origin and the hatch date of the bird. And a ring number which also links to the ring numbers of the parents of that bird, proving that it hasn't been taken out of the wild and has been bred in captivity. An A10 is particularly important if you want to use your hawk for work, as in displays or pest control, because Schedule 4 birds cannot be used for commercial gain without an A10. Obviously there are more than two laws that affect falconry, but these are the two most important ones that I think you should know about. And I'm interested how falconers outside the UK are affected by laws, so if you are a falconer in a different country, then please leave me a comment about the laws that you have to abide by. Remember to like the video and subscribe as well, I've got some exciting videos coming out in the future of this channel, so please keep your eyes peeled for those.